morning again. I, oh, it's afternoon. It's afternoon. My apologies. Good afternoon, church. It's really a pleasure for me to be here again uh, in this beloved church of Bury. Some of you don't know me. I grew up in this church. I, uh, I remember the first time I came to this church, I brought the children to this church. That was about 11 years ago. Uh, then I was the, um, the children's ministry leader at Cambridge. Do you remember? My boys were this, 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 uh, this short, but now they're that, that tall. But now I come wearing a different hat of women's ministry. Thank you very much, Elder, for allowing me to be here today, and thank you, everyone, for participating. I bring greetings from Haverhill. It's not very far from here. It's just about 25 miles, but that way, not that way of Cambridge. We are that way. So we are in another village, and uh, they say, I should tell you, that they love you. And hopefully, you will be able to go and see them one day, or they will come and worship with you. And also, I bring greetings from uh, Women's Ministry um, Department. It's um, the department that is very dear to me. A few years ago, I um, asked God for a ministry because I believe I could do anything and everything. But I found myself going around the circles, and I wasn't really that enriched, you know, when you touch here, you touch there, you touch there, and your bag becomes full of uh, everything. And then I said, God, help me. I need that ministry. And one day, uh, he pointed me through my friends, women's ministry, and I've, I never looked back. So I pray that um, God will use me and to use those that have passion on that ministry because it's a very dear ministry. Last week, we had um, a retreat, Area 8 retreat. Do you remember, ladies? It was only one person from this church. Our area here, here it's Ipswich, uh, Cambridge, Haverhill. We've got about nine or ten churches. We had 25 ladies attending. It was our first retreat, and we were blessed to have our BUC leader as our main speaker and ladies let me tell you we were blessed we were revived we were renewed we were transformed and we have been pumped up with energy now if you find my energy coming out please i still have a residue from last week and the encouragement is if such retreats are announced or advertised or anything else, we take heed of them because there's always a blessing. Gentlemen, there is a retreat for you coming up for Area 8. They have taken it over. They said the ladies can't go and we are left behind. So watch out on the news of Area 8 and let's all go and be informed, revived and renewed. Isn't it good? That's very good. So, um, and then I met Sister Mary there. And Sister Mary said, Flora, I didn't know that you can wear the hat of this hat of being behind the pulpit. I just know you by singing. But I said, oh, oh well, there you go. So when she had a cancellation this week, she said, you might as well go to Barry. I'm sure they'll love you there. I said, OK, thank you. And I hope that the message for today will bless each one of you. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for the opportunity of worship. We thank you for your love, Father. We thank you for your grace. Father God, we ask for your Holy Spirit to tabernacle here, to be upon your children, Father, so that they can hear from you, not from me. Hide me behind the cross, Father. And help us to understand that which you have prepared for us. And forgive us if we have sinned against you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The, the scripture reading, I, I suppose you have got different uh, translation. 
translations from the one I have. So we will just follow it through your translations. I will be doing it with my translations, but if you can help me read through your translations so that you can get a bit of it, yeah? There are so many lessons that we can get from this scripture, but I have decided that we concentrate on the lesson of faith. As I was looking through, some people have looked through it, the mission of Jesus. Others, they have looked through it. Why did Jesus call a woman a dog? Is Jesus a racist? Is, can Jesus insult? And uh, so many lessons can be drawn from this. But I have decided that today we concentrate on the lesson of faith. So we will read through Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, and go further down to 28. And on verse 21, it reads, then Jesus left Galilee and went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Remember, Jesus was on his mission. The mission that was sent to him by God. His mission, he had continued few years, but at this point, his mission was drawing close to the end. But his popularity was growing up. People have heard more stories about him. People have heard what wonderful things he has done. People have heard him opening the eyes of the blind. People have heard that he opened the ears of the deaf. And many people were getting to, wanting to be close to him. But then he decided to withdraw from where he was into the region of Ty and Sidon. And it says this region was a region of the Gentiles, the region of Phoenicians, hence some, some places they would call this woman a Siphonician woman after the name of that place. But it's said to be, it was a quiet, quite a quiet place. And Jesus decided to go away from the multitudes, to go away from his disciples into this place. One wonders, why did he do that? If he was sent to heal, if he was sent to preach, if he was sent to do miracles, why does he withdraw to be alone? And from the book of Mark, we understand that he did this because he wanted to be alone. Jesus wanted to have a spare time for himself, a time for him to do a, a, a deliberation, a time to prepare himself, for he knew what was coming after. And also he took time away from the disciples because he wanted them also to prepare themselves, to have time to think what will happen next. Because he kept telling them that I am here, but I'm going. I will be going away. And also, we learn that he took time to be out of this place from the hostility of the scribes and the Pharisees who were no longer excited about his preachings because now he was drawing a lot of people to him. He didn't run away from all this, but he took time to go and speak to the Lord. And this was the time for him to retreat, the time for him to rest, and the time for him to recover. Retreat is important. Even for those who are married, take time to retreat. Take time away from all the pressures. Me time, we see that Jesus did it. It's not wrong. We need me time. Some people will tell you, at me time, that's when the Lord spoke to me a lot. And during that silent moment, that's when I heard from the Lord. So me time is what we get a lesson from verse 21. Then we proceed. Verse 22. A gentle woman, a Gentile woman, pardon. I do it in quotes, a Gentile woman. 
Some Bibles, they call her a Canaanite. I don't know what your Bible says. What's your Bible, sister? Canaanite, yeah. Mine says it's a Gentile. She was given this. She was identified from the place where she came from. So for you, would say a, a Berean woman or Hevahilian woman. But for her, she was identified as a Gentile woman. First of all, I have to apologize, gentlemen, for emphasizing on the woman thing. It's not that I'm becoming a gender biased, but I have been reading a lot about women and it's all that I have in my head. So just take yourself to be in this position, right? Is my apology accepted? The men of the house? <laughs> yes, okay, I can proceed now. Now, just to make more emphasis, the Gentile woman, during those days, historically, a woman had no status. A woman was seen as nobody. A woman was seen as a low class being in a society. So therefore, she had no relationship with anybody, let alone the relationship with Jesus. There was a lot of hoo-ha politics going on um, between the Gentiles and the Jews. And now we know that Jesus is a Jew. And now this is a gentle woman who is identified here. It says she came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is possessed by a demon that torments her severely. I do not know your situation. I do not know how the people around you class you. I do not know if you have any barrier that is there between you and your Lord. It could be the barrier of your color. It could be the barrier of your class. It could be the barrier of your work, your status in a society. But that form of barrier does not matter when it comes to the contact with Jesus. You can go beyond that barrier. You can be tested beyond that barrier. And you can have access to this Jesus. This Jesus is for everyone. This Jesus that we see here doesn't matter who you are because he sees you as valuable. You are a child of God. You are created by this God. You are a son or a daughter of the Most High. Wonderfully and created you are. And more so, this Jesus is coming back for you. So why don't you go to him? Why don't you reach for him? The Gentile woman took that step. She came from wherever she was and went and sought Jesus. Hence the Bible says to us, seek he first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. So today I say to you, seek ye Jesus. And she calls on to Jesus because she had a trouble. The gentle woman was just not in a leisure time. She pleaded to Jesus, it says. She said, Lord, have mercy on me. This sounds like a woman who was in distress. NIV Bible says she was pleading she began to cry out to the Lord. And I think it's uh, amplified. It says she was in great distress. I don't know how, how, how your, Bible, your Bible says she was. She begged, Jesus. she begged Jesus. She was just not in a comfortable setting. She was distressed. She was desperate. She was depleted of her emotions. She was distressed. Her heart could not settle down. So she cried out. She says, have mercy on me. Who can pray this prayer? 
the, the, this, the loud voice like this can be heard from the heart that is distressed. From this could not be just a superficial loud cry. This could have not just been one of those calls that one does occasionally. Or this could have not been a, a prayer of uh, contentment or a shopping list where we say, la 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 la. She was crying and pouring out to the Lord. It sounded like it was an intense prayer. It sounded like it was, she had that deep desire in her that she wanted Jesus to know about it. To me, it sounded like she was hurting. She was unhappy. She was struggling. She had a broken heart. I would imagine that she even had tears in her heart. But she pressed on. Pressed on regardless of the barrier of being a gentle woman. She went to meet Jesus. And that is where, number one, her faith was tested there. If it was one of us or me, I would have probably debated, is it the right time? Can I do it? Am I worthy to do it? But because she felt so empty and she had heard about this Jesus, she reached out to meet this Jesus. Her heart obviously was overburdened. So she reached out and she cried, Lord, have mercy on me. I do not know that which is in your heart this morning. I do not know that which burdens you this morning, that you can step out from your familiar territory and call out to Jesus. Let's search our hearts this morning. Let's not keep it in ourselves. We do have someone who can deal with it. We do have someone whom we can access and hear from. Psalms 34, verse 17. Shall we move there, please? Psalms 34, verse 17. And can somebody open Psalms 107, verse 13? Psalms 104, verse 17. It reads, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. Psalms 34, verse 17. In another translation, it says, the righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from their troubles. So this Jesus is available for the righteous. This Jesus can hear you. This Jesus can deliver you from all your troubles. Can somebody read Psalms 107 verse 13? Then they they cried to the Lord. Mine reads, Lord, help. They cried in their trouble. Lord, help. They cried in their trouble. You cannot cry if you're not troubled. Recently, I have just had, um, I've just gone through, uh, last month actually, a very patchy month. I think I did come here one time and ask prayers for my sister who was very ill. So I had to travel to Africa because I got a phone call from oncologist there and they said she was left with hours 
to live. And for where I come from in Lesotho, which is in Southern Africa, you take more than 12 to 16 hours on the flight before you can reach. And I was told you just left with a few hours. I packed clothes, you can imagine. One, I even took one shoe. Another one, I took a, a, a top without a trouser. But it was that distressing moment for me. And I remember leaving and going there. And the Lord, I was just praying to say, God, even if you can allow me one hour with her to share with her the love of Jesus, that will be okay. I wasn't concerned of meeting her so that I can see her before. No, my concern was to share that last moment and to tell her that Jesus loved her. Anyway, God allowed me 10 days with her. Amen. And the 10 days was the most difficult 10 days because she could not talk, she could not respond, she could not express herself. She, she was sort of like, yeah, it was really hard. But during this time, what I did, I, I prayed to God, I said, help me to tell her about you because I come from a home that is multi-religious. Everybody is anything and everything. I'm the only Adventist, the whole village because in our villages we live as uncles and aunts and whatever. It's not, you know. So I'm the only Adventist that I am. But I say, I prayed, I said, God help me to tell her about you in her last minute. Then um, my worship was, I would read miracles for her at bedtime, regardless of the fact that she doesn't hear. I had a faith that God will speak to her. So every evening, I would read a miracle for her. And in the morning, I will read a psalm to her. I was reading this too because I, I had an impression that if I tell her that God can do something, she, she can believe in it. And also to proclaim and pray over the, the promises, then she will enjoy the promises knowing that God is still there for her. So we did this for 10 days. And every session that I did for her, when I'm praying, she will make a sound. And I used to be so pleased because I believed that she could hear. She was hearing this God that I was sharing to her. And even the days when she, her last days where she really showed she was in distress, when I prayed with her, she would keep quiet. She, for hours, she would be asleep and she would look comfortable. But my prayer then, I wasn't just praying with, you know, with confidence with the long things and shopping list. Let me tell you, church, I had never been in so desperate mode for 10 days like that. I remember I would start and at the end I'll be in tears, I'll be in the Bible, I'll be out of the Bible, I'll be in tears, I was, my heart was, breaking it was pleading to god i wanted god to do something in my sister and i hope and i am so thankful that god gave me 10 days with her so whatever that has happened during that 10 days but i believe i did my part i told jesus about my troubles I told Jesus about my burdens because I couldn't bear it. And this morning, even this woman that we meet, a Gentile, she comes to Jesus because I believe she believes the same thing, that it's Jesus who can hear our troubles and it's Jesus who can bear the, our burdens. So when we are in distress, when we are in pain, we tell it to who? To Jesus. And Jesus alone can 
bear the burden for us. And in her worship, she continued, O oh, son of David, she called Jesus by the right name. She worshipped Jesus in her distress. So when it was tough for her, she just didn't step back and blamed. She didn't have that guilt feeling. But she opened up to somebody who can relieve her. So that could be another lesson for us. That though our trials are heavy, though we are going through tough times, there is a son of God, a son of David, that we can cry to. In our sad moments, we can remember to worship God. And where we have just read this morning, in John chapter 4, verse 24, it says, then we must worship in spirit and in truth. And a lesson for our Sabbath school this morning emphasized that our worship should be the worship that is done wholeheartedly to the Lord. He has got so many words, so many names to express who he is. Others, they call him Yahweh. Others, they call him Jehovah Jireh. Others, they call, they call him so many. But all those, in a nutshell, it shows who God is in our lives. And God needs our adoration and our worship. Let's continue. Matthew chapter 15. And after she worshipped God in her distress, she expressed that which made her to be so distressed, her daughter. Now this is another aspect that we touched this morning. Her daughter was possessed by a demon that torments her severely. Can you just imagine? Mothers, I think you know this one better. Just imagine your child ill. Just imagine your child in distress. That's not nice, isn't it? I have never had a child who is very ill, but I have looked after children who are very ill. And you find the parents themselves get so distressed because of the distress that is in the child. And this is, I would imagine, would be the similar situation with this gentle woman. She was in a deep sorrow because her daughter was different from other daughters. Her daughter needed a relief from the evil one. She was in really in a difficult position as a parent. I don't know how your children are. I don't know how your siblings are. Let's take this not just as children that we have born. Let's take them as the children out there, even in a society. When they are not in the good line of being good citizens, it disturbs the whole place, isn't it? So just imagine in your own house, but she just didn't step back. That was another test of her faith. She had a child that wasn't well. Today we see our children. Um, I'm sorry to say this, but even the schools, they are taught difficult subjects that disturbs them. They have access to all these games and gadgets that disturbs them. They have got social media that disturbs them. They have got friends with a different upbringing that disturbs them. They may not be evil possessed, as in the spirits in them, but their behavior is just not normal. And that disturbs. Unfortunately, we do have children, even in the church, with a similar experiences. 
and that disturbs. The Gentile woman didn't just keep quiet. Their distress was so much that she needed help, and she went out and reached for help. Sometimes, if it gets too much, we have to accept it and reach for help. It's not wrong to reach for help, but you have to be mindful of what kind of help you go for. I cannot prescribe the care and the, the help, but here we have learned the source of help is Jesus. Jesus can help our distressed children. When the time when we do not understand them, let's take them to Jesus. We have another example of a parent, Job. In a book of Job, it says Job was a devout man, but his children, they used to go partying, right? It says Job used to pray for them when they go out at night. Eli himself, he was the high priest, but his children were doing something different. And we have got two different types of, here of parents. Job prayed for his children, night and day. Eli, he was a sort of like oblivious, if it's the right term, of what was happening. Today, we see a woman with a similar experience as Job. She took that which bothers her about her daughter to Jesus. Our children will not become a great children by just accident. It is our responsibility as parents to nurture them, to mentor them, and now we have learned even to pray for them. God requires us to pray for our children. And ladies, I have learned to do that. As I, I shared this morning, I have gone to, I did one um, retreat, I think it was two years ago. That retreat opened my eyes of how much the devil can um, get our children. And from that retreat, I said, Lord, if it is to stand at three o'clock and pray for these two boys, I shall do it. And I haven't stopped to the fact that sometimes in the morning, someone goes out, mm, mommy, your singing was too much today. I said, I shall sing until I sing no more. And if he goes and I don't know where he is, I go to his bedroom and I say, Lord, I touch his shoes. I say, Lord, he's wearing another pair, but there's this pair. Wherever he's walking, walk with him, Lord. And this is the type of the cry Hannah cried. It's not wrong to cry to the Lord for our children. The children are the gifts from God. No child is born a criminal. No child is born devil possessed. But it says in First Peter, he's out there to devour them. And our man, the mandate is to pray for them and to cover them so that God can save them, that God can bless them, and God can heal them from this possession because it is an illness. It's just not normal. So we continue to present our children so that God and can help and can stop this devil from attacking our children. The Gentile women did the same, and the behavior of her, of her daughter tested her faith. If she had a waving faith like some of us, or like me, I would have been so distressed, or I would have blamed why the child is like that, but she pursued Jesus, and she presented her daughter to Jesus. In Psalms 91, I think it's from verse 3 uh, upwards. That psalm, I like it. And I'll urge you to pray 
using that psalm. I've learned to pray with it. It covers all areas of our family life. It covers all areas of our children, our siblings, and our family members. They're coming out and they're going in. They are staying and the activity in the house. Because unless we cover them, we would not know. Only God knows the areas of their need. We proceed. Verse 23. After she called in distress, after she pleaded, after she cried, what happens? What happens? Jesus said no word. That was very unusual of Jesus, isn't it? Church, was this a usual behavior of Jesus? No, he said no word. It's like he paid no attention to her. Or he, he ignored her. Or can we say he didn't hear her? No, he must have heard because it says she cried. She begged, but he decided to keep quiet. And this is another portion that tested her faith. What would you have done if Jesus kept quiet? Keep begging? Sister, what would you have done? Keep yelling, Keep yelling until he answers you? I suppose he did. She did. But it says Jesus kept quiet. He gave her a silent treatment. Sometimes we pray. Sometimes we call out. Loud or just okay. And oftentimes or sometimes it looks like even our prayer or calling out just goes on the deaf ears. He doesn't answer us. So what should we do? Give up? Stop calling him? Stop worshiping him because he's not answering us? Should we stop calling on to Jesus when he's not answering us? It says sometimes he can answer you with no, or he can say yes to your plea, or he can say wait. God's timing it's perfect. And God knows your needs. And God knows the right time for you. So when he is not saying anything to you, so when he is not answering you according to what you want, it's not because he's ignoring you. It's not because he's turning a deaf ear on you. But just remember that his timing is perfect. We says we pray without ceasing. And that's all what we need to do. What comes after our prayers, it's not for us, but it's for God. Hannah prayed. She prayed until Eli thought she was drunk. I, I can even imagine that she didn't just pray for one year for a child after she got married. It said she prayed for a long time. And when the time was right for her, God blessed her with a child. Same to us. When we don't get the answer, let's continue. Let's exercise that faith. When we are tested for not getting a reply then, let's continue. Our God is not deaf. Our God will not turn the deaf ear on us. It says he is available all the time. And in response to, us, to that, now we get a different reaction. So this woman had been really, really tested. Can you see her journey? With this one, she has been tested so many times. Now had the disciples, instead of helping the situation, what do they say? In verse 23, the other part of verse 23. Tell her to go. She's bothering us. She's making noise for us. Maybe they were even 
now become impatient. She was too much for them. They were getting embarrassed by his noise. They wanted to get rid of her. Or the other thing I, would, I thought probably they would say, Jesus, give her what she wants so that she goes. They were not interested in her as a person. They didn't exager- exercise any compassion on her. The only thing what they saw was she was bothering them. And this was another test for her. If you are told to go away and you are in desperation, what do you do? But she pursued. She was really determined. She really wanted her desire to be met. She continued to stay in with Jesus. Sometimes in our lives, we will get those people who are distressed and they complain, they murmur, they say a lot about their problems. How do we as Christians respond to them? I'm likening us here as the disciples because we stay with Jesus, right? We are God's children. How do we respond to people when they come in who are in distress or making noises around them? Do we tell them to go away? because they're bothering us? Or do we show them love? Do we show them pity? Do we show them compassion? Because our Jesus is Jesus of compassion and God of love. When we are tested, or when they come with a test, how do we react to them? Verse 24, another interesting insight comes in. Jesus replies differently to them. At first, when he, re- he didn't say a word, now we can only say what he says. And he said something very, very different from what I expected Jesus to say. And he addresses another political side of it. And this is another Bible story on its own. I read uh, another commentator in in some way, I think it was in the Book of Mormon, but they were sort of like not very much of Christian. They were saying Jesus was, um, he exercised some, um, what do you call it? Not racial, uh, racism on this statement. When he said, I'm not here for you. I'm here for I'm so for so and so. So they didn't approach it the way we would approach it. And I just laughed. I said, no, this is a different picture. Our Jesus is Jesus of love. And is Jesus of compassion. Though he cannot, he didn't show show it at the first place here, but he he looked at the woman and he wanted to see how far the woman can stress her faith. So this time, Jesus awoken her faith and confidence and responded to her. But he didn't say, yes, I will make your daughter well. But she reminded her of who she is. She reminded her that she's a Gentile. She's a sinner. But she is in need of grace. She in need of her mercy. Perhaps sometimes we need to be reminded who we are for us to appreciate Jesus. I don't know. It's a food for, food for thought. But I, I did think like that. Now, is another thing. Her, test, her faith was tested by being reminded, by her being humbled, because Jesus humbled her and reminded her of where she comes from for her to be where she is today. But this woman, I love her, she did not give up. She pursued again because she was determined to get what she wanted from Jesus. She wanted a healing for her daughter. And when you intercede for somebody, you don't just say it once and you step back. Sometimes you have to intercede over and over and over and over again. The same thing, For our children, we can intercede. Some of them, it takes them years before they can be who God wants them to be. And she persisted. She did not give up. 
She pursued her interest. She did not change her mind about Ted. She continued to plead for mercy. She continued to intercede for her daughter. And now she uses the, another approach. Lord, help me. Son of David, help me. I guess now she was getting into a really, really um, end of a straw. And I would imagine at this time she was kneeling down. She was humbled. She was crying. She was tearful. She, her heart was breaking even more. But she did not give up to ask for mercy. What do you do when you are pushed to the last button? Why do you cry? I don't think she was crying hysterically here. I guess now here it was her last bit. She was really, 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 really in it. Do you lose hope of your situation? Do you give up because God didn't answer you at the first stage? Do you quit? Or do you go out now and seek answer from somewhere else? Because we said, you must tell Jesus all of your troubles and your burdens. And he didn't say, answer her accordingly. Now she takes another step. She continues to cry. But what do you do then when your, answers, when your question, your, your thing is not answered? Press on, my brother. Press on, my sister. That when you feel you've been tested to the last road, do not give up. Jesus is still there. Jesus knows your needs. Jesus will look after you. Jesus will heal your burden. And Jesus is an answer. Verse 28. Now, verse 28 it makes me smile because it's a result of that unwavering faith. It is a result of that faith that can be shaken but stand strong. It is a result of the persistent prayer. It is a result of the interceding prayer. And it reads, verse 28. Note how Jesus addresses her here. In my translation, which I love most, it says, Jesus said, dear woman. It's no longer a gentle woman. It is dear woman. Who says dear to you? I'm sure he even smiled because he could see the difference is this woman. And he goes, dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. What an instant relief. Jesus has the power to change your situation instantly. I do not know what you are struggling with. I do not know that which drives you to the edge. I do not know that which breaks your heart. You know it. It's not my stand to know it. But what I can remind you, exercise that unwavering faith. Continue to pray without ceasing. Because Jesus is an answer. A tested faith can make a difference to you. It will make a difference in your physical life. You'll be healed. It can make a difference in your social life. It will make a difference in your emotion and even in your spiritual life. Jesus has got power to deliver us. So why not go to Jesus? in a time of our distress. There are a few lessons that I drew when it comes to the end 
from this woman. Yes, she was a Gentile, that of not a faith, but there are good lessons that we can draw from here. First of all, lesson number one, she had love. She loved her daughter. She loved her family. And I suppose during that process, she loved God. And we know that this God is God of love. And her love for her family, for her well-being, pushed her to push on through the barriers of life. The love for what she had made her even to meet Jesus. Lesson number two. This gentle, a stranger, and low, lotless woman, or a Canaanite, if I may address her like that, she had faith in our Messiah. She heard what this Jesus did at the towns. Though she had not met this Jesus herself, but she had faith in this Messiah. So she reached out to meet this Messiah. Remember, she declared and called Jesus a powerful, a, a miracle worker, and she called her by the name, O oh, Son of David. Her unwavering faith made her to push and to be persistent. Her faith grew through the experiences with Jesus. And her faith made her to worship this Jesus in truth. The time when she was heartbroken, the time when she was humbled, she continued on her knees. And her faith made her to come in contact with Jesus. Lesson number three. She was persistent. So we saw that she loved. She had unwavering faith. Now she was persistent. Persistent in her prayer. Persistent in her mission to reach Jesus. She could not be discouraged. She could not be deterred by anything. She could not be discouraged by anything. Her last hope and the hope for her daughter was Jesus. She persisted and met Jesus. In conclusion, for our faith to be declared real, what is it that you have to do? Perseverance in our prayers, fully depending on the mercy of Jesus. But remember, we live in a sinful world. One way or another, our faith will be tested. One way or another, our faith will be shaken. Are we going to be able to stand the trials as they come? Don't give up. Don't quit. But be still and know that Jesus is an answer. And this we can only get when we go forward to seek Jesus. May the good Lord bless us as we pursue, as we go on, as we 
we persist, as we continue to pray, as we intercede, that we should not be discouraged, for he is coming soon. And when he comes, he's going to come for you and for me. And it's my prayer that we continue to exercise the, this faith so that at the end we can be called to have a great faith. God bless you all.